Lee Henninger. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing excellent. It's pouring rain here in Portland, Oregon for the first time in forever. In Portland, oh, man. Portland misses you. I know you're broadcasting from where? Park City, Utah. Is that right? Yeah, I'm in Park City, but we've been having some crazy rain and hail too. So I think Portland's been sticking with me a little bit. Uh, has the uh, spring been slow to arrive in the Wasatch? That's always the most frustrating thing. I remember when I lived in Colorado and it would continue to snow and hail and have cold rain into May and June. And you're just like, come on, let's go summer. Yeah. Is that how it's been? Yeah. I'd say it's, it's, it's a pretty big tease here. Like you'll have a week of seventies and dry and all the trails are dry and the snow starts melting. And then you have a couple of days of like hail and rain and then a little bit of snow. And luckily I think we're on the tail end of the muddy season. So the trails aren't getting like super muddy from the snow luckily. So they're still pretty dry, but it, it is kind of frustrating. But it's it's good mental training to have to go run in like 20 mile an hour headwinds and some sleeting hail. Yeah. So if you look at it that way. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think the mm -hmm. bad weather is, is definitely a uh, a strengthener and something that does build character that hopefully totally. uh, is an advantage uh, when you are running on beautiful days in, in competition. So I, I guess before we turn back the clock and talk about background and stuff, I think it would be kind of interesting just to kind of talk about where you, why you're in park city right now, obviously you and I have actually been able to hang out and interact quite a bit recently, but you lived in Portland for a long time. And it seems like you kind of used 2020 and the flexibility that was born from the COVID pandemic and being able to work remotely to your advantage. So maybe tell myself and the listeners sort of what you've been up to over the past year and, uh, you know, maybe uh, why uh, Portland misses you so much. Yeah, I think I've been really grateful towards my career because they've been really flexible for 2020. Um, now, disclaimer, that's coming to an end, but I did kind of take full advantage of the flexibility and kind of just start trying out new places. So last summer I had come to Park City to train um, for like just a week, just a vacation, and I fell in love with it. And so I was like, man, okay, how can I make this work for the summer? And luckily that was when the pandemic was at its highest and my boss was really flexible and said like, okay, let's make this happen. Go train there for three months. And so I got to spend the summer here last summer and then kind of have been ping ponging back, back and forth between Portland and Bend, just kind of playing around with different areas while I have the flexibility. Um, and then kind of in making this my last hoorah. So I don't think I'll be able to stay remote forever. My job is as a scientist is very much in person. So come July, I'll be back in on campus doing work in person, but basically this last two months since it's going to be all in Park City, kind of getting ready for Western States. And again, super grateful that I'm able to do this with my job. Um, they're pretty flexible, but I've also accrued a lot of PTO. So I'm kind of going really far down the bank with this. So I'm taking a lot of PTO so that I can kind of just focus on training and recovering and actually treat this race relatively seriously and just kind of give it my all for once, just because obviously life as a professional trail runner for most of us does not mean we get to eat, sleep and breathe trail running. Um, typically we're balancing it with a lot of other things. So it's been kind of interesting to really just devote all of my time to trail running and just like, it's, it's been awesome. So yeah. I feel really grateful. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I want to circle back on the PTO conversation when we start talking about Western States, but I think it's a brilliant way to approach it. And definitely uh, makes your your PTO uh, really valuable leading up to what will probably be the biggest, most important race uh, to this point in your career. But, you know, before we get to it, I think uh, there's a lot of things that I want to cover with you. And I think to set the table, just to make sure that everybody has a feeling of who Keely Henninger is, I, I think it's always fun to just kind of start with background. So maybe give uh, the listeners a glimpse into Keely Henninger, what your childhood was like, where you grew up, the things that you were interested in and your history with sport. Sure. Yeah. So I guess I've never really described my life that far back, but this will be pretty fun. Um, so I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. It's a pretty small town. Um, and all through my youth, I kind of wanted to be a boy. So I played all the tomboy sports, wanted, <laughs> loved wolves, read the entire wolf almanac and was like into skateboarding and soccer and basketball and all the sports you can imagine. Um, and that kind of carried over into like middle school and high school. And I just consistently played soccer and basketball and some other sports sometimes. Um, and so was 
always absorbed in the sports culture. Like sports were my life. They were my family's life. Um, it was very integral part of my growing up. Um, and that's kind of how I built my community as well. And so my whole life, like I said, it was ingrained in my family. My dad's side is just this huge athletic beastly family. Like there's so many numerous professional golfers, basketball players, baseball players. And so my whole goal for my life was to play basketball for college. Um, being 5'11, I was like pretty suited to play basketball. Um, always a little bit too small for being the big girl, but loved basketball. So that was my goal. Um, and basically a couple of injuries, which obviously is not too shocking now that I've been injured again, um, kind of put me in the back, put basketball in the back seat. So I ended up not deciding to play in college. And so I kind of found myself in this weird place where I was so used to having this community around me always and having something to strive for and having a team um, to having nothing. So I kind of started just dabbling in some, some casual running while I was doing um, my undergraduate at Penn State. And that's kind of where I started to first find like cross country and just like road running and long distance running and really just started getting absorbed by that community. And yeah, I kind of fell in love with it. And at, at first I was super unhealthy with it, as I think a lot of runners are just because I think that narrative that's fortunately starting to change the initial narrative really encourages like not a very healthy relationship with running. Um, and so the first couple of years were a huge battle for myself. And luckily by my junior year, I had found trail running through a relay that was actually held every year at Penn state. Um, and so I had done this relay and then my boyfriend at the time had asked me if I wanted to run a half marathon in the trails and I was like, oh, sure, whatever. Like, I'll go run a half marathon. And I get there and the only option is a marathon. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't have anything for it. Classic. I have a foam. Classic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have like a foam Dunkin Donuts coffee mug that I end up hair tying to my hand to carry my water in and end up finishing and like doing super well and just getting kind of absorbed in this trail community because everyone was yeah. so awesome. And central Pennsylvania trails are rugged and super gnarly. And the community is so enveloping and loving and caring. And it was so amazing. So I kind of started looking more into trail running and trained for the national championships of the 50 mile, my senior year of college, yeah. um, and ended up getting second in that, um, to Cassie Scallon, who is a beast, beast. um, and yeah. was my idol at the time. Um, and a 50 and, mile, yeah, it's sort of a 50 mile specialist. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Really good at that distance. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Um, and at that time I was really like at a crossroads in my academic career where I was like really wanting to go into medicine, but super burned out from really just being type one or type a undergraduate student in neuroscience where I just did way too much. And so my two really like lovely biology professors were into trail running and mountain biking. And they kind of just encouraged me to take some gap years and just pursue this running thing. Because at the time I had then by that time I'd ran a couple more races and had success. And yeah. so yeah, I ended up moving to Boulder and doing some like research there as well as running and kind of the rest is history. It's kind of just like continued to snowball from there. Yeah. Um, so so was, yeah, pretty cool. Was your move to Boulder? I mean, did you choose that location because you wanted to improve as a trail runner in addition to your academic work? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like that was, that was like the spot to train. Right. So definitely the first priority was moving there because of the mountains. Yeah. So you also said that when you first kind of got connected with running in general, that it sort of became clear that there was a lot of unhealthy things related to it as well. And this is something that we'll talk in more length about, I think, later on in our conversation. But can you just kind of expand on what you mean by that? Yeah, well, I think when you get into any sport, you look for this, you look for a narrative, right? You look for some of the role models to start talking to you about what's good for them, what they do for training, like what equals success, right? And so when you're getting to a sport like running right away, like the narratives that were out there when I got into it were super unhealthy. Um, and we're all focused around body image and leanness and how small can you get and how maybe not getting your period was this badge of honor. And so the women I started seeing at the top of this sport, and granted, this is not everyone, um, we're just kind of showcasing those qualities. Mm. And so it kind of started to trickle into my own subconscious and then started manifesting itself into my 
um, actions as well. And yeah. so I think just like getting into the sport initially was just not a super healthy, healthy, um, progression for me. Yeah. It's so interesting. I feel like I just was so naive about all this stuff until very recently, actually. And mm. you and I are both team sport athletes growing up. And when I was younger, it was always all about being bigger, gaining mm -hmm. weight. And I always struggled <laughs> to actually, you know, put, put weight on in order to perform well as a mm -hmm. team sport athlete and a lacrosse player. And it wasn't until I was in my thirties until I even really learned about this whole phenomenon of losing weight in service of performance. And I actually want to go into deeper uh, or go deeper into this subject as it relates to running and cycling on future podcasts. And you and I are going to talk a lot about it here coming up, but uh, thanks for setting the table on that. Cause I think it's a super important discussion and, and something that uh, is going to be valuable for the listeners, but you know, just to sort of round out your story, you now work at Nike in addition to being a professional runner for Nike. Can you just tell us a little bit, you said you're a scientist, tell us sort of what your job is, uh, what you're focused on there and how it relates to the overall brand at Nike. Yeah. So I, I do research in our sports research lab and basically can cover anything from footwear to apparel and really just focus on understanding the body, whether it's on the outside or the inside. Um, and so I feel really grateful to be able to study athletes as well as apply that to my own training. And then Nike is just a culture that really supports athletic endeavors. And so it's been really cool to be able to pair my work and my passion with running, which is also my passion and not feel guilty when one might take precedent over the other and yeah. have really just felt like the community and the support from all my coworkers and a lot of people on the Nike campus for um, pursuing both, both of my car careers, basically. So some of the research and work that you do at Nike is used to inform the product that goes to the market. Is that right? That's so cool. Yep. Awesome. There, is there such a theme in our sport of just hyper intelligent science oriented women, right? It's like you and Rachel Drake and Caitlin Gurman <laughs> and Hillary Allen. And I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a, a dozen more that I'm not thinking of right now, but I wonder what that, uh, you know, why that is, what the overlapping personality <laughs> traits are that, you know, bring science, uh, oriented people into, into ultra running. You want to speculate on that at all? Yeah, no, I, I wonder this often because I think I can be really critical and very scientifically driven for a lot of my thoughts, but I don't know if I've tended to apply that to my running in the past. I yeah. feel like we actually are pretty decent runners because we have a case of amnesia and we kind of forget how awful sometimes <laughs> running could be. So it's almost like the use of the, the not using of our brains. Um, but I think also to, on a more like positive note, I think trail running is very like, it's a very like strict sport and it's very challenging. And I think like, if you like to problem solve and think critically, it's like a sport that mm -hmm. is kind of like fun for us to challenge ourselves with. Totally. Well, uh, I'll continue to represent the dumb person demographic. Oh, in this please. Sport, but, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's really cool. And you guys are super inspiring. So, um, you know, as a, I want to start talking about kind of your, your running career now that we sort of have your background established. And I uh, have obviously sort of been following your career from the earliest days. And even though you're still only, you know, 28 now, I think you've been in the sport for a while. You've done a lot of races. You've done some amazing things. And, uh, you know, for the purposes of just kind of like uh, focusing on, you know, sort of part of your career and not going too deep into the weeds, I think the the best place to sort of focus our time and energy is on the 2018 season that you had. And because I think that the story sort of comes to a crescendo there and, and then spider webs in both directions, both past and future and in a really interesting way. Um, so you had been in the sport for a little while. And then in 2018, you sort of like put your stamp on the sport and um, really established yourself as a world-class competitor. You won the Chuckanut 50K, you won Lake Sonoma 50, both obviously name brand races here in North America, super uh, important races with a lot of history and tradition. And then you traveled internationally and finished fifth at the Lavaredo Ultramarathon in Italy, a super important race, and finished your season with a fifth place at Cape Town. And then the year before in 2017, you were fourth at CCC. And so if you 
put all that together, the end of the 2017 season, <clears throat> and then the totality of the 2018 season, and there are a few races that I didn't touch on there too that you performed super well at it became very clear that like Keely Henninger is here, you know, you made your mark on the scene. And at that point, you're only 26 years old, starting to perform on a world-class level. And of course, as you mentioned, you didn't really come from the traditional background that a lot of women did that you were competing against. I'm just curious, looking back on that now, sort of how did that year impact how you were thinking about your, yourself, the sport and your future in it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think looking back on it, that year kind of makes me sad because I was never fully happy with the results I was having, regardless of how, how good they might seem to the onlookers. Um, but I really think that that, that year really solidified in my mind, like the potential that I can have as well as how poorly I was executing it. Um, and just like the kind of negative spiral that came after that. Um, but yeah, so I think that year was like, while it was really important for my career, it was also like really important for me to start to like, take a, take a foot off the gas and like back up and try to figure out like what the best, the best process was to move forward with. Yeah. So, I mean, did you always have the expectation that you could perform at that level? I'm just curious, <clears throat> like one of the things I'm always interested about is how athletes deal with having self-confidence or, you know, mm -hmm. having a lack of self-confidence. And I think it's something that I've always struggled with over my career. And that's one of the reasons why I find it so fascinating. And because I view you as a kindred spirit in a lot of ways <laughs> in that we didn't come from the traditional background mm -hmm. when you were sort of performing at that level, winning Lake Sonoma, for example, I mean, that's a super, super important race. And you're only 26 years old at that point. Uh, what were you thinking in terms of like your future in the sport and the things that you wanted to achieve? Were you like, kind of, uh, were you, were you confident in, in your ability to, to get to that place and to, and to move forward from it? Or were you a little bit more surprised? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'm going to back up just a little and give a little bit of context. I would say up until 2018, I had no clue how to run and, and run for myself. I was so used to team sports that if I got to, if I, if I didn't train 100% correctly or fuel 100% correctly, and I got to that negative mindset in a race, I didn't know how to push through it because in my mind, I'd never really had to do that before. I was always pushing myself for a team. And so I feel like all of my races leading up to 2018 or, or the end of 2017 were were like good, but they were never my potential because I just, I didn't have that extra mental gear. Um, and I, I'd say the, the big switch for me happened at team championships in Italy when I was on team USA, the summer of 2017 before CCC. Um, I think I had my worst race of my entire career. Like it was miserable, like cramping, walking so <laughs> bad, but I'd never persevered that hard in my entire life mm -hmm. because I had a team waiting for me. Wow. And so I reached this next level of mindset that I'd never really reached before. And I really think that that kind of spiraled into my end of 2017, beginning a 2018 career, um, because I just ended up realizing that you have this third mental gear that when things get tough, which they will in a trail race, right? you're able to push through it and run for yourself. Um, and up until that point, I don't think I had that. And so that really carried over into my confidence because I knew that if I put the training in, I would have the fitness. And then if I could reach that third gear in my mind, then when the going got tough, I could continue to push instead of kind of back up like I had years prior. Fascinating. Yeah. I yeah. just, it, it's so interesting just kind of, kind of looking at your career in totality. Yeah. That, that race in, in Italy seemed to be, you know, one of those like really hard learning experiences that launched you forward then into that next category, which you sort of have established yourself in since that 2018 season. But of course you and I both know that it wasn't easy after that. And it's also, I think just so, uh, I think eloquently stated that, you know, you're one of the things you were dissatisfied about looking back at it is that you didn't enjoy it in the moment. And then, you know, a short time later, you sustained a fairly serious injury that sort of put you on the shelf 
in 2019. So maybe give the listeners that story and just kind of tie back in sort of like how you were feeling coming off this amazing year where you're probably getting all sorts of different accolades and people patting you on the back and you're starting to feel like you're really starting to establish yourself in the sport only to have the rug pulled out from under you. So maybe talk Mm -hmm. a bit about what the injury was and how it felt. Yeah. Yeah. So coming out of 2018, I guess in the beginning of 2018, I had one Sonoma. And at that point, I feel like my training and my energy balance was still right on that line. And so in my mind, I was still pretty strong and I was really certain about not going and running Western at that time. Um, I I didn't feel, yeah, I I turned down my ticket. I didn't feel like I'd been in the sport long enough. I didn't feel like my body was ready for it. My mind wasn't ready for it. And I wanted to do that race justice. Like that is the be all end all race. I respect that race so much. And I didn't want to just run it because I was supposed to. And so I was really strong on that. Right. And, and I think I could, if, if I could go back and tell myself when the, like, the downward spiral started happening. It was, mm. it was come that next fall kind of after Lavaredo. Um, I started questioning, like, why didn't I just do Western? Like all these people want me to do Western. I should do this. And all of a sudden I wasn't really running for myself. I wasn't enjoying running as much. I would go really hard for a bit and have to take a couple of days where I just took it off, but it was mentally and physically so stressed. Um, and did not enjoy any of the races I did after Lavaredo, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so going into 2019, because why you you weren't enjoying them because you <clears throat> felt like you were trying to live up to a standard, or so I think that that was probably one of the facets of the stress. But I think really it was this accumulation of too much training, too little sleep, mm-hmm. too little fueling, and it was just too much stress. And so I think it was just it was just snowballing in a bad way. Right. And it was getting to this point where it was going to just launch me off this edge. Like as a professional athlete, you're always towing that line, but when you fall over that line, like there's, it's hard to get back over it. And so I think I was just slowly getting over that line and, and that manifests in so many different ways. I didn't like running anymore. I was weird about work or weird around my friends. Like I was just kind of out of it. And it was really just accumulation of all of this stress. Um, and so going into 2019, I was still like not stoked about racing at all. Mm. And so I was finding myself forcing myself to run, not just like on some days, right? Like we all have to force ourselves every once in a while you wake up in Portland, it's pouring rain. You're like, no, (laughs) (laughs) like today. (laughs) Exactly. But it shouldn't be like an everyday thing. Um, and it was really just it was just continuous for those first couple months to the point where I knew something was wrong one day when I went for a run and I pushed through it anyways. And then lo and behold, I had a stress fracture in my pelvis. And I'd say that stress fracture was accumulation of just too much stress and like a common problem for females or male athletes is just training past your body's point of like recovery. And it was just not able to sustain all the pounding. Um, yeah. So that's, that was my big injury starting 2019. And that set me back a good amount because you have to rest a good amount of time off of that injury, um, for, for you to even be able to start running again. Um, and then yeah, silly, silly me. I tried to run CCC right after I got back from the pelvis fracture, which really just meant let's prolong the stress state. Right. So so yeah, I took six weeks off, but then I just went right back to the hammer and like, oh my god, I didn't so, ease yeah. back in. I did the exact yeah. same thing. Like so silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, my story is exactly the same, and that I had an awesome 2018 <laughs> season. I totally felt like, oh, I've got this stuff figured out, <laughs> copy paste. It's all gonna be the same. I'm never gonna mm-hmm. lose a race ever again. And then I broke my ankle, and then yeah, went into my own spiral, uh, physically, emotionally. And, uh, yeah, there's so much I identify with because I then also pushed myself to try and get back into training and racing well before my, Mm -hmm. my body was ready. So anyway, it's, uh, important to talk about those things. And now after having 2019 be a wash due to that injury for the most part, I mean, you still did race a couple of times. So did I, but you know, it was, Mm -hmm. I think below, the standard that you and I want to race at and certainly below Mm -hmm. the number of races that you and I typically like to do in a year. Mm 
And then 2020, of course, is ruined because of COVID. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling now uh, <laughs> physically uh, and you know, psychologically as you return to the sport and competition um, after a couple of years of, you know, sort of be being uh, on the shelf, both uh, voluntarily and involuntarily? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question too. And I feel like you'll probably relate to this, but I'd say when you first get injured and you think, Oh, I'm taking six weeks off because I'm injured. Like in my mind, I thought that that was going to be like this lovely six weeks of rest. And my body was going to be the hundred percent better at the end. But I think we both know that when you are injured, that's a lot more energy going towards fixing yourself. And, um, you're not just stopping everything, right? Like if you're, if you were like, I was coming out of that pelvis injury, I was cross training like crazy. So you're really not giving yourself rest. You're just injured and stressing your body another way. Totally. And so coming out of that injury, um, to your point, I raced North face, got top 10, but was probably one of my worst races, especially mentally. Same. Same. Um, yeah, it, I don't think I ever actually had the rest I needed. I just tried to get back from that injury so fast. That was my only goal that it just ended up being, I was not anything further than I was before I got injured. And so going into 2020, um, I think we all kind of were, you know, a little shocked with how 2020 played out. And so I think it affected us differently, but the first month or two of the pandemic, I was a little bit of a head case, um, where I started running again for no reason too much. Um, and, and finally was able to pull back a little bit, but ended up sustaining a pretty severe ankle sprain that ended up avulsion, avulsing. I can't even say that having, having an avulsion fracture on my medial malleolus from one of the tendons tearing during the sprain. Um, and while that injury was really frustrating to me at the time, because it felt like something like totally outside of my control, I actually viewed it as like a way to stop running and like actually rest and come back to running when I wanted to. So it was like this, this revolutionary thing where I stopped running and wasn't rushed to come back. And so I just let my foot heal and then came back running when it stopped hurting. Like I was not rushed to come back in six weeks or eight weeks or whatever. And I think that rest was like what my body and my mind needed, because now I feel like I can dissociate like my identity from running and really just be more content with like off time as well as really hard runs and really easy runs. And so right now I feel probably one of the like fittest levels of, or the highest levels of fitness I've ever been, um, with a lower running mileage per week. Um, and just like a happier mindset than I've ever had as well. And so I, I credit that to being able to like actually take time off and refine my like priorities and myself, but yeah, I feel really good right now. Um, and it's obviously been a journey, but it's pretty fun to be in this spot. Yeah, it's beautiful and <laughs> such a great lesson too. And again, I so identify with it in my story too. And that when I had broken my ankle and it was clear that I shouldn't be running, even though I pushed myself through that feeling for a really long time until it got to a point where then my Achilles gave out. And then it was like, okay, you really need to stop running instead of using that as my signal to take a break, get yourself healthy. Then I started just hammering on the bike until then I crashed my bike, separated my shoulder, got a concussion. And that was finally the moment where I was like, bro, freaking stop, man. Like you're the universe Mm -hmm. is trying to tell you something. You need to freaking just stop thinking about staying fit and what races you might be able to put on the calendar in the future. And instead just embrace the fact that you have to get yourself healthy before you can start thinking about those things again. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. So before we move on from the subject of, of injury, I want to read something that you wrote that I think is just beautiful. (laughs) And then maybe ask you to expand on it. This is from, I think your blog. Anyway, you, it's a, the, the in closing of a sort of a, a piece that you wrote sort of a, as a letter to yourself um, mm. about being injured. And it says, so this is Keely writing to herself. There will come a time where there will come a time where none of us can run. We won't be able to hide from ourselves. What will we do then? I want you to be strong enough to embrace it with open arms, accepting and not shying away from it. When the day comes to leave running or other sports behind, you merely take out your scissors and cut cut it off the edge of your web. You are enough without it. I think that's brilliant. (laughs) 
Do you want to uh, expand you. on that at all? I mean, I think this goes back to the idea of, you know, your identity beyond being an athlete. Uh, but maybe how did uh, how did this thought come about in your mind? And how did uh, maybe you you come to this realization in your own life? Yeah, well, I think none of us want to accept the fact that one day we might not be able to run. Um, so I really came to this thought when I was unable to run and realized that me not being able to run made me doubt my self-worth in all other facets of my life. And so I no longer was great at my career in my mind. I no longer was a good partner. I was no longer a good friend. Um, and it was all tied to my running. And and I kind of just slowly started picking those pieces away and, and trying to realize that I was good enough without it. And, and my old, my former self would have never acknowledged that. And so I really just think that we all need to remember that we're a human being and we're, we're enough without running. And so that it should be just a part of our existence. It should make us stoked and bring us joy and be like this sense of like amazing accomplishment. And it should add to us, but it shouldn't be like the core of our web. It should be able to be cut out at times when it's needed because whether it's a big injury or you're not able to run again, or maybe it's just like you had a shitty week at work. Like you should be able to take that running out of your life and it shouldn't affect your identity and your ability to like have joy in your life and feel accomplished with yourself. And so, yeah, I just thought that the the web analogy was pretty good to kind of emphasize that and drive that point home. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I'll, I'll link to the, the full article so, so people can read it. And I'm just envious that you learned this at such a young age and, you know, for me. Uh, yeah. My, my whole life fell apart. Without it. So, anyway, it's a great lesson. And uh, you know, I think it's really important for people to hear people like you talk about injury and how to get through it. And that it's not all about staying fit when you're injured. It's about figuring out your internal life, focusing on other things and being more than a runner. So let's talk about something else that, you're very passionate about and that I really admire your advocacy around um, that is sort of body image stuff and women's health stuff. And you referenced this at the beginning of our conversation. I think we should go into more detail now. And I want to start this part of our conversation by just sort of referencing an amazing article that you wrote for the Trail Sisters on uh, trailsisters.net, I think is their URL. And again, I'll share this in the show notes so people can read it in totality. But can you just kind of share the Cliff Notes version of the message behind that piece and why this <clears throat> subject is so important to you? Yeah. So I think coming from a basketball background, I again was always too small, but it was it was always this like this goal to become muscular or whatever. And there's always these body image types. Um, however, when I turned into running, I found that people were just speaking very critically of other people's bodies without really asking for permission or really wanting to understand what was happening on the inside. And so I really wanted to highlight this point by just kind of sharing an antidote, an anecdote from my own experience, experience when I was running in 2016 or 17, I believe. Um, someone had just started commenting on what I looked like. So I was all of a sudden called big girl. And at that time I was running well, mentally was not very strong. And the person saying that, that really impacted me negatively. Um, and they didn't, they didn't care to ask like how I was doing or anything like that. And, and I feel like that is just very indicative of the culture. And so I think we're all very like apt to assume like, Oh, somebody looks fit or somebody doesn't look fit or you should eat a hamburger. You shouldn't eat a hamburger. But I think at the end of the day, like we're all unique humans that look a certain way and we can't just fit into this mold. And <clears throat> I think instead of like really focusing on what people should look like or what we think a runner should look like, we should really just start focusing on their health and their mental health, their physical health. Like that might be like asking them how they're doing instead of just assuming what they're looking like is indicative of how they, how they look inside. Um, and so, yeah, that, that piece was really just to start to bring to light, like the images or the issues we have with body image in the sport and how those can negatively impact a lot of runners and lead to a lot of really negative and like non-beneficial practices in their own training and racing. Can you just kind of expand on the story that the piece is built around in this person calling you big girl? 
Sure. Yeah. Well, so I was running White River. Um, it was my first race in the Pacific Northwest. So five and a half years ago now, which feels like an eternity, but it was your typical Pacific Northwest day, rainy and dreary and poured the entire race, but it was amazing. And those court, those trails are amazing. And I was winning the race, um, from mile like 15 or so. And basically the first time I saw this man, he all of a sudden just pulls up in his car and starts yelling me, go big girl, go big girl. And for the entire rest of the six hours of the race, that was my name. Um, and that's what he called me at the end. And like, I've found out that he's called other women different names as well. And so that one really like stung. And then I think what really made me want to highlight this story was fast forward two years when I win Sonoma and (laughs) this person still finds the need to come up to me and, and whisper in my ear, like, Ooh, not looking so big, big girl. And, and I just wanted to like laugh in his face because I was like, you don't even understand half of the journey that I've gone through. And you're just seeing like what you think my body looks like compared to a different time and compared to what you think I should look like. Um, and you're commenting on that instead of saying like, wow, you ran a great race. Like, how are you feeling? How's your training? How's X, Y, or Z, right? There's many things you could comment on. Um, and so just that superficial, like rating of what he thought my body looked like, and therefore thought I should have raced, um, was just so appalling that I felt like it was a really good way to highlight how negative the sport can be and like what we should really strive away from in the future. Yeah. It's just a appalling that uh somebody would say that in whatever it was 2018 at the time but i mean it's again yeah just a really great thing that you have a great voice around and uh definitely something that i would encourage people to go back and read and it reminds me of something also from my life you know as somebody who's also tall you know and i i guess like i said earlier in our conversation the whole weight and body image thing wasn't really something that I had a lot of awareness about. It's naive to say, but honestly, I Mm -hmm. never really thought about it. But actually in 2018, I had won the ultra trail Mount Fuji race in Japan for the second time. And that fall, the North face asked me to go back for a, like a press tour where I just went back Mm -hmm. to Tokyo for I think four or five days and did you know, 10 or 15 interviews with different publications over the course of a few days. And literally in every single interview, a Japanese journalist was like, how much do you weigh? And and so after the third or fourth one, I was like, what the hell? Like, why are you guys always asking me how much I weigh? So it was like, you know, it became a, a little bit, um, self-conscious. I I guess, you know, if this is too sensitive, we don't have to talk about it, but as tall people, you and I, I mean, this is just sort of like in my brain now, like, has that been something where you've had like self-consciousness around it? Because like when I see photos of myself, like on a start line or something, I'm like, wow, I'm actually huge. Like, I don't (laughs) feel like I'm that big, Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm wondering, you know, as somebody who has a great voice around, uh, you know, body image and women's health stuff, um, has your own experience being, you know, on the taller end of the spectrum in the women's field and certainly against the people that you're competing against. Is that something that maybe birthed this interest in the subject? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think there's a reason why I didn't publish the trail sisters piece for two years since that race. Right. Um, I definitely was not super comfortable with myself as well as like the negativity around like bigger bodies or taller bodies or whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, I was super uncomfortable for a couple of years, especially cause like I'm taller than most men. And so in my mind, I'm like, of course, I'm like going to be a big girl always. I'm 5'11", almost six feet tall. Like I'm always going to be the odd one out on the start line. And so like, yeah, it's definitely awkward. Um, But now like what I've realized is that, A, you can't judge someone based off of what they look in relation to how fast they're going to run. Mm -hmm. There are people in all avenues of running. Granted, it might be a little more niche in track and field and road there's women of different body sizes, men of different body sizes who run phenomenal races, right? And you might not ever have picked them out of the crowd because of what they looked like at the beginning. And so I think as I've realized like what my body needs to be really successful 
and just becoming more content with like, Hey, I'm never going to be like this tiny little person because I just can't be, um, I've gone more content with it. And now I just don't mind because I know that like to be a really good runner and recover and not get a bone stress injury from being too far gone. Like I need to be a certain weight and a certain amount of muscle and I need to be fueling and doing all these things. And that might look differently than other people. And it should look differently than other people. But yeah, I mean, I wish this is one thing I really wish is I hope maybe you can have some insight into this as well, but like, I wish I could have talked about it when I was going through it more. And I think that's one thing that I really want to try to change in the sport is having people talk about this when they're going through it a little bit more than like retrospectively, because obviously it's the hindsight's always 2020, right? Like I can look back on it now a little bit better than I did at the time. But I think going through those struggles publicly, or at least with friends and stuff is probably helpful for the sport as well. Totally. Again, I think it's just a a fascinating subject that deserves a lot more conversation. And I remember I was talking to my, my friend, Tim Johnson, and actually I want to have him on the podcast. He's a former professional cyclist, you know, national Mm -hmm. champion cyclocross guy, and just talking to him about food culture in cycling. Mm -hmm. And I remember him Mm -hmm. saying that he didn't learn how to eat until he was in his thirties because his whole life was, you know, born around, being as light as he possibly could for performance Mm -hmm. and uh just a such an unhealthy uh psychological state to be in for such a long time totally yeah great that we can talk about it and i think for sure in in trail and ultra running you're much better off being a stronger athlete than a you know a super thin or tiny or you know as light as you possibly can uh type type athlete so totally and i think like if you're forcing yourself to look a certain way, that's when your body's just going to be unhealthy. Like you might get to a lean body type or a smaller body type. You're like by eating a lot more than you think. Like if you start trying to force it is when you start getting those imbalances and the inability to help your bones stay healthy and all of these things. And so I think like trying to force a certain body type and weight is like the really bad problem. And I think if you actually treat your body with compassion and fuel it properly, your body will get to its natural state. And it might be leaner than you thought you could be anyways, but you might be pumping in 4,000 calories a day. Like you just really need to like respect your body and not try to force it it to fit into this little stereotype. Beautiful. So let's sort of uh, tease something that you and I have been working on together for, for the pillars app. Uh, You reached out to me sort of shortly after we got everything launched and sort of pitched me on this idea that I thought was brilliant. So tell the listeners uh, what we're putting together and uh, what they could expect to see with, uh, with Keely Henninger uh, around the subject. (laughs) Yeah. So pillars seemed like this amazing Avenue and platform to showcase a lot of things around female athlete health health because pillars is really something that's talking about like the whole athlete and how we can empower the mind and the body and have better lives. And I think this felt really, this hit really close to home for me because I feel like as a female athlete, there's a lot of things that we need to discuss that could actually like become these pillars to really helping us reach our potential. And so I'm really excited to partner with Dylan to like start talking about a lot of different things around female athletes, like body image and mental health and bone stress injuries and the menstrual cycle, and really just start to normalize these things so that women can understand that they, they can reach their potential as well as like start identifying some red flags in these spaces Um, so that they, they can reach their potential. I think that's my biggest thing is like, we have all of these things that really make females unique and we can utilize them to like reach these new heights that we've never reached before. And I just want to start to elevate that, um, to everyone. Yeah. And we're super, super grateful and you've been amazing to work with. And we're really excited about the women's health module that's coming together now and should be up within the app, hopefully within the next week or so. So thank you for all your hard work on that. It's been a treat and certainly something that I couldn't provide. So (laughs) it's really fun to be able to, you know, tap the expertise of cool, smart, interesting people in in my network and have you help out with uh, what we're doing. It's amazing. So thank you. Let's talk about Western States. It's coming up. Heck yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, for those who are listening, we're, we're going to be putting up a YouTube video. Uh, it's not up 
right now as we're recording, but will be by the time this airs. And uh, I think it's amazing where I got to chase <laughs> Keely for a workout that she did here in Portland while she was in town a few weeks ago. And uh, certainly put me through the ringer during your workout. So I'd encourage people to go check that out on YouTube. And of course, I'll, I'll do a little plug for, or a little, uh, I'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, but I guess, uh, let's start the conversation around the race with, you know, how you got in, you know, you got in via a, a special ticket from the ultra trail world tour. Uh, so what were your feelings upon learning that you had gotten into the race as a uh, first time hundred miler going to what is <laughs> definitely the most important hundred miler in North America. And also, I guess, with the perspective of having, uh, turned down the ticket in 2018, as you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in the show, what were your initial feelings? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, my initial feelings, I was stoked. Um, but I also had a little bit of guilt because I realized that I hadn't quote unquote earned my ticket. Um, but it was like the two years between turning one down and applying for the golden ticket. I just, I had felt like I'd gone to a new place mentally as well as physically. And then Western is just this this be all end all race where you get the biggest names in running, you have the best community, the beautiful trails. And it was just something that I really wanted to race and test myself at. And so I was really stoked that I got in. Um, I called my parents, my mom actually was like, wait, uh, I didn't know you were going to run a hundred miles, <laughs> but I was really stoked. happy for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I was really, really stoked. Now this was back in 2020. And so I was planning to run it that year, but obviously that did not happen. And so I got carried over to this year. And so it's been three years since I declined my first ticket and then was planning to race Lake Sonoma kind of as like a nice little tune up for the race. Um, try to, sh try to throw down like a nice course record there, or like at least contend for the win to that kind of feel be like, okay, race. I know the women's it's field so awesome. Lake Sonoma so. was shaping up to be so incredible. Mm -hmm. I hope it actually happens with that. I hope so too. In the fall. I think it's going to uh -huh. be September now. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, in a nutshell, I was so stoked. And I think I took a day, I accepted it. I took a day to like come to terms with getting in through the world tour and then realize like, you know what? They let, they got me in. Like I shouldn't feel ashamed from getting in this way. Um, so yeah, I'm just stoked. I'm so stoked and grateful for the opportunity to to run Western. I think the trails like will suit my my running ability well, but also I'm just so stoked to like be at the start line with all of the amazing women and men who will race it and like all of the infamous trails that are in that race. And, totally. Yeah. You're going to do amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to watch. Let's talk about kind of career progression stuff because I think this is important for younger athletes or up and coming athletes who are coming into the sport now to hear someone like you who had the opportunity to run Western States in 2018 after winning the Lake Sonoma 50, one of the most important races in North America and actively turning that down because you felt like you weren't ready or that it didn't speak to you at the time. Can you talk about that decision um, and sort of how you came to arrive at that decision rather than sort of succumbing to the pressure of, oh, I have this opportunity, I have to take it, and instead focusing on the long term? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we can all get we can all get kind of like sucked into this hole of of expectation where everyone's like, oh, you must race this, you must race this. But when we pull ourselves out of that, what we these races are hard. And so we have to be racing stuff that we want to race. Right. And, and so for me, I didn't want to race Western yet and I didn't feel like I was ready. And so going into a 100, doing it just because you think you have to, that is not going to end well for anybody. You're going to be too stressed. And then when the going gets tough, your mind's not going to be there. Cause you're not into it as much. You're not as invested emotionally and like your stokes not there. And so that was the big part for me was like, I just wasn't ready for it. And I knew I wasn't ready for it. And so I didn't want to do it yet. Um, and so I think with this sport and you can contest to this or attest to this, like you can race every month or more like the year of 2018, I thought I didn't race enough. And I raced like seven or eight races and three of them were a hundred K like that is absurd. Yeah. <laughs> and so and I then in 2019, happened, your, your health sort of betrayed you too. Yeah, so exactly. That was a big learning experience. Probably. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. And so you race so much at the time, you don't think it's too much because you're recovering, you're young, you're able to recover, but the long-term effects of that could be detrimental. And like, you're not going to be able to perform the best at all of those races. And so I think when you're like new getting into the sport, you really just need to, to race the races that bring you the most stoke and like train specifically for those races. And then just make sure to recover after them. That might mean not running for like a couple of weeks or more. And, and I think like the culture really promotes like, Oh, you race Sonoma. Oh my gosh. Cool. Well, what's next? Or like, Oh, what's next after that? And it's like, Hey, wait a second. Can we just pump the brakes and acknowledge that I just ran 50 miles that kind of sucked. <laughs> and no, I don't want to think about what's next right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, again, I think it's <laughs> instructive for younger athletes to understand that they should take a long-term approach to the sport. I mean, but definitely do need to listen to what motivates you and what gets you fired up. And for me, you know, when I was 23 or whatever, the Leadville 100 was what fired me up. And I was like, I am doing that, you know, and looking back, I'm like, well, maybe I would have been better off if I would have focused on the long or the shorter stuff before moving into the longer stuff, because I feel like I've done a lot of these super long ones now, but at the same Mm -hmm. time, I was like, that's what I cared about. That's what I wanted to do. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, what what I listened to, but my way isn't correct. And your way isn't isn't correct. It's a, it's a balance of, of the Mm -hmm. the two. And and I think listening, taking a long-term approach, but, but definitely listening to what motivates you is is super important. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just <laughs> going to say that, I mean, it was awesome that in 2018, you didn't feel like you had that stoke for Western States. And if you would have gone into the race without it, you probably would have had a shitty race or not even finished because hundred mm-hmm. milers are super hard. And if you have <laughs> one excuse, or, I mean, you're always going to have an excuse to drop out of the race. And so you have to go into it with that feeling of like, there's nothing going to stop me. And now you're going into it with, it sounds like that psychology this year. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. And just like another addition to that is like, we're only getting better as we age for this long distance type racing anyways. So there's no reason to like rush your body and your mind to race these longer distances before you're ready. Mm-hmm. Cause you're going to just get better with, with age and experience as well. So. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I think this will be something to look out for in this next chapter next generation of the sport, because in the U S especially trail running is synonymous with ultra running. Right. And I think in Europe, definitely there's a lot more opportunity for aspiring pro athletes to go and race super competitive races that aren't necessarily ultras or that are Mm -hmm. shorter distance ultras. And obviously in the U S we've got faster, shorter races, but they're usually 50 K's, right? It's Mm -hmm. like way too cool. Chuck a nut races like that. Those are still ultra marathons and, uh, obviously like still are, are hard to get through. Um, so my hope is that we'll start to see more of that proliferation or maybe a less of a, an association between trail running and ultra running being sort of synonymous in the U S and have it be more like it is in Europe where Mm -hmm. trail running is, uh, is a catch all word that, that encompasses races of really short distances all the way up to whatever, 200 plus nowadays. Mm-hmm. So yeah, recently you, uh, you did the Peterson Ridge rumble 40 miler. Now this was sort of like the, the first opportunity to get back to racing after the COVID year and after Lake Sonoma had been canceled this spring and you had an amazing <laughs> race. How did that feel after coming off 2019 with the injuries and 2020 with the, COVID, et cetera. Um, how'd that feel? And where, how do you feel now about your fitness going into Western States? Yeah. I mean, that race was, was a really good mental test for me. Um, because I haven't had one in so long. And so luckily starting off that race, there was a woman who ran out with me for the first like four miles. And so kind of triggered the race mindset and gave me this fuel for the entire rest of the race where I was like, Nope, she's right behind me. And, and I didn't know where she was, but it was just really good to have this like trigger where I was like, not letting myself give up. And if I got into a mental, like a little bit of a struggle, I would be like, Nope, we're going to keep going. So 
it was a race where I really got to practice my mental integrity, which I think will really help for Western. And like I said, I hadn't had a chance to do that in a while because North face that I ran in 2019, I was a mental wreck and I just kind of started giving up. So, um, it was really good to feel that, that fire again, and like, just really keep pushing throughout the whole thing. Um, one of the downsides of that race was I twist my ankle again, which you can probably relate to, which is always so annoying. And actually ran on it for a couple of weeks after, and it was feeling pretty good, but, um, I had a little tweak kind of happen up or just like a twinge. And so ended up meeting with Matt, a really awesome PT that you recommended and kind of just took a couple weeks, like relatively down just to like, let that niggle kind of get away and make sure it was nothing. And it was probably during like week seven or so of like Western States training, right? Like pretty peak time where I wasn't running much. And I came out of that now, no niggles, feet feel strong, haven't lost any fitness and like pretty stoked about it. And so I think the race and just all of this training is just continuing to like really like increase my confidence in my fitness and in my body and my ability to like really respect what it needs when it, when it starts to like flare up a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I think the training is going, going as good as it can, obviously training never goes as planned, but I think it's going pretty well. Yeah. Amazing. So you just sort of mentioned your ankle and working with Matt Walsh and stuff. And of course, now I want to read your Instagram post from today because I think it's amazing (laughs) because it sort of captures everything that we've been talking about to this point. So if you don't mind, I'm going to just read read the caption. (laughs) Uh, How about this episode where I just read, read things that you've written? (laughs) Sorry. Okay. So here's what Keely posted on Instagram today. It's a picture of her on a bicycle and it says, I took two weeks down from running during one of my peak training weeks for Western States and I am so grateful. My ankles got overworked after a gnarly sprain during my race at Peterson Ridge Rumble. At first I tried to push through them thinking that they would surely resolve themselves before the race. Then I remembered all the times, quote unquote, pushing through niggles resulted in full blown injury and I backed off. I had a small pity party for myself and then took full control of the problem. I scheduled time with an amazing PT who specializes in ankles and trail runners. This is Matt Walsh, former guest of the podcast uh, and uh, contributor to Pillars also. And scheduled images for peace of mind and rehabbed, strengthened, hiked, and rode my bicycle a lot. All of my images came back negative. The niggles subsided and I began running again. A couple of years ago, I would have beat myself up for being too cautious, but this year I was only grateful. I had gained two weeks strictly dedicated to two things and I had gained two things strictly dedicated to two things I am weakest at, ankle ankle strengthening and hiking. I would never have prioritized them as much without this break. And to be honest, I probably would have been ill-equipped to run a hundred miles. I now view this two week period as an integral part of my training for Western States 100. And I'm glad that I listened to my body. Training rarely goes perfectly and that's okay. In the grand scheme of things, our disjointed training only makes us more adaptable. If you find yourself mulling over small turbulences in training, just remember that in trail running, the entire race is full of turbulence. So buckle up the mind and get ready to enjoy the ride. You got this five weeks. Let's go. It's beautiful. Is there any, you know, I just want to add too. I just am saying that Kat Bradley responded that she spent yeah. two weeks on a bike, six to eight weeks before Western States. So that's <laughs> a good uh, reason to to also you know be hopeful and to embrace that little uh, bit of turbulence as you put it in your training. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good omen. Yeah. So anything you want to add there? I also kind of wanted to talk to you about, you know, you work with Tyler Green as a coach. So maybe just like kind of give us a glimpse into what your training has been like. I mean, obviously with this hiccup, um, that's sort of thrown a wrench into things, but maybe talk Mm -hmm. a little bit about what you guys have been working on as a coach athlete uh, duo. Uh, He's getting ready for the race himself. Um, And obviously part of this will be documented in the video we put together, but I think people really love to hear sort of how someone like you is getting ready for what will be a super, super important race in your career. Yeah. So at first I felt like, um, kind of like the boy who cried wolf with my ankle. I'm like, Oh, I need to take time off. I need to take time off. And 
and and Tyler is so receptive to that. And so he kind of just let me take time off until I felt comfortable. Um, and it didn't throw a huge wrench into our training. I'd say obviously for those two weeks, like we were not doing the big runs and stuff that we had planned, but I was doing pretty much everything else. And then a ton of biking and hiking that I don't think really results in a lack of like fitness. Um, but I would say what we've been really focusing on and what we'll continue to focus on in the next couple of weeks is heat training, um, eating while running and then running downhills to get the quads eccentrically contracting and getting them ready for all of the downhills at Western States. Um, and then for me, for the, the two weeks that I was down running was really emphasis on hiking, which I hate doing. I don't know about you, but I hate it. <laughs> not my thing, but it was probably good for me to get some hiking in and just feel comfortable doing it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's really our focus right now is that staying, just staying healthy and staying in a good mindset and really just focusing on that downhill running, that heat training and the eating, because at the end of the day, that's, what's going to be the biggest, uh, like for us is what the biggest thing is for the Western States. But can you, can you disclose what that means practically? Like, are you doing sauna sessions and downhill repeats? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm not doing any downhill repeats currently, but that is scheduled for a couple of my big runs coming up. And it was scheduled for a couple of big runs in the past couple of weeks before this. Um, and so it's not an every week thing. It's pretty much only a couple stimulus of it because you don't want to completely trash your quads. The damage to the muscles that happens during a ton of eccentric loading is pretty vast. And so you really just want to have that stimulus. So your quads know what they're getting into, but you don't want to overdo it. Um, so yeah, so that equals some downhill reps and where I you're running like the downhills a, hard. A little bit goes a long way on those things too. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to overdo it. It's just to get the stimulus. And then heat training is a combination of time in the sauna, as well as whenever I'm running and it's not super hot out, I'm kind of throwing on extra layers as I can. Um, and just trying to be out in the sun a lot. And like, while I'm out there taking fuel with me and water and just really practicing, like eating what I'm going to be eating on the day, carrying the things I'm going to be carrying on that day. Because I think that's one thing I've done poorly in the past, um, for some of the European races, at least was I'd never practiced with packs on. And so you get to the race day and you're like, what is this? And so I really think just getting dialed with those little things is going to be pretty helpful. Totally. So let's circle back to something that you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that I think is awesome and uh, valuable for the listeners to hear you talk about. And that is you using your vacation time to focus on your other job that is being a professional runner. <laughs> Tell us about what the thought process was behind <clears throat> that and what value you've seen in it. Yeah, well, I guess I kind of had a wake up call last summer when I was running with some of the Bowerman track athletes in Park City, realizing how much they prioritize running. Um, and with that week of PTO where I was training here, I felt like I was recovered and running really well and all this stuff. And so with all of the PTO I've accrued from not being able to travel <laughs> for the past like year and a half, I decided that with Western, I really just wanted to be able to focus on recovery is the biggest thing and training for the peak weeks before Western and, and basically live at altitude so that I can start getting that stress response as well. Um, so yeah, it meant taking a lot of my PTO out of my bank, um, and utilizing it so that I don't have to be on zoom calls like eight to five or be in the office, um, which I know are small potatoes in the big scheme of things. But I think like, you know, we only have a, like, we have a limit to how many times we get to run these races. And so in my mind, it's like, why not kind of go all in into this race and really just prioritize training for a couple of weeks at one that when it's most important and really just focus on recovery and see what happens. Because it's like, I don't get many chances to know, like if I get to put all of my time into this, like what actually will happen. It's kind of, kind of a cool experiment. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the word you use of just being all in is, is, uh, yeah, the right way to approach it, especially for a race that's so important. And I think for younger athletes or aspiring pros, it's just a good illustration of how to behave like a professional. And obviously, like mm -hmm. you said earlier in the podcast, being a professional trail runner usually means that, you know, you, you at least have something else going on to help you earn a living. And obviously you have a, 
a big real job at Nike that you have to balance at the same time with your huge athletic goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so taking three weeks of your PTO, which of course you could have used to go to Paris for three weeks after the race. Instead, you use it three weeks before the race so mm-hmm. that you can just focus on training and recovery. And I think that's what behaving like a professional does. And, yeah. uh, and uh, hopefully that will be rewarded. And I mean, yeah. I'm doing the same thing, you know, I'm 35 <laughs> now. And so I get, to run, I get to run hard rock this year, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, it seems like all indications are that the race is actually going to happen this year, but I'm going to go Mm -hmm. train in mammoth for six weeks, which of course is going to cost a a small fortune. But at this point I'm like, you know, this might be my only shot, Mm -hmm. not getting any younger. I'm going to pull out all the stops and, uh, and behave like it's my job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think that's it. And you probably agree with this. It's probably what's exciting. The most exciting to me is where the sport can go. So as it becomes a little bit more professional and there's more money into it, like I think the potential of the females and males in the sport can just grow exponentially because right now, most of the, the really good athletes, and I don't say all because some of them do do it full time. Most of them are balancing like families and jobs and everything. And so if there becomes a point where the sport can afford to have more full-time athletes where they can actually recover and dedicate more time to running, like the the times and the runs and all of these things we're going to see are going to just start being like insanely impressive and just like change exponentially. And I'm kind of excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. It's an interesting, I think, turning point right now, but mm-hmm. at least, you know, if not people going fully professional, at least having the, the flexibility or the opportunity to do training camp type things like you and mm-hmm. I are both yeah. going to be doing. So mm-hmm. anyway, more good, uh, learning for the folks listening. So, um, you know, Keely, I would love to, um, sort of hear a little bit about your, your goals for the race. If you're open to sharing them, I know this is your first hundred miler, but I know you're a competitive person. You're a great athlete. Um, well, how are you thinking about the race in terms of how you want to approach it? And if there's any goals that you've set for yourself? Yeah. I mean, I think like every race, my biggest goal is always just to like to keep pushing. And so like, just keep the mind strong throughout, but I'd say for Western States, if I'm being ambitious, like I would love to break top 10 and in my, in my ideal world, what I think I'm most capable of is, is top three. And so I really just want to run like my own race and stay consistent and true to my own fitness and then be able to push when the time comes to really just like finish strong and run a really solid time on that course. So Um, I'd say, yeah, I have really high goals, but I'd say at the core, like my goal is just to stay tough, which I think honestly, if you can continue to keep the mind strong throughout an entire hundred mile race, like you're, you're bound to do pretty well anyways, because it comes down to a lot of mental strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know you you don't want to look beyond Western States, but you know, while we're on the subject of goals, I'm, I'm curious, just kind of like where you see yourself in the sport in the future, uh, what are some of the things that speak to you and maybe what are your longer term goals? Yeah. I mean, I think I just want to be able to continue to run in the sport. And so my focus has become a little bit more long-term focused. Like I really want to be able to continue to run and push my body for the foreseeable future and not be handicapped all the time. And so I'd say I'll probably continue to choose less races every year, but just have more focus and more like time dedicated to each one. So maybe it is like, I, I treat each race like a little bit more like my job and take some time off and really focus on it, but don't do quite as many as I used to. Um, and then I'd say like, I really just want to also continue to grow the sport and grow like female and male, male awareness around like proper training and proper nutrition and proper ways to like really reach their potential in this sport. And so that we can see the sport grow in a really healthy way. So yeah. I want to stay in the sport for as long as I can. And so, yeah, I'm going to prioritize my own longevity so that I can hopefully help others reach theirs. Heck yeah. Well, Keely, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It's been so fun to <laughs> hang out and collaborate on the few things that we've been working on together over the past few months. 
I will certainly be cheering and rooting for you at Western States with the rest of Portland, Oregon, who misses you so much, but good <laughs> luck in these, these last few weeks of training. Good luck with the taper. And, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there in Olympic Valley in uh, about five weeks. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for letting me showcase a lot of these issues on the pillars app. I'm so excited for everyone to see them. You're the best.